To kickstart this morning's program, we're interviewing one of the most dynamic global real estate entrepreneurs. To host the conversation, we are pleased to have with us Jay Hennick, Global Chairman, Chief Executive Officer, and the largest shareholder of Collier's International Group. Collier's is a leading global real estate <clears throat> services company with 12,000 professionals operating in 69 countries. Jay is also the founder, chairman, and largest shareholder of First Service Corporation, a North American leader in the essential property services business. In 1998, he received the Canadian Entrepreneur of the Year Award and was also named Canada's CEO of the Year in 2001 by Canadian Business Magazine. Please welcome Jay Hennick, who will introduce our distinguished guest. Good morning, everyone. I think many of you know who uh, my guest to my left is. You're right. Uh, welcome, Barry. It's an honor to have you here. And uh, we all look forward to your, uh, your insights. Um, many people in the room know Barry Sternlich as the chairman and CEO of Starwood Capital, a private investment company he founded in 1991. Starwood is focused on global real estate, hotels, multifamily office, retail, and single family rentals, among many other things. So we're just unfocused. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. Okay, okay. I'm just trying to wake everyone up, <laughs> including <laughs> myself. <laughs> Your people sent me this. I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> Barry also serves as the chairman of a very interesting uh, real estate property trust called Starwood, which is the largest commercial mortgage REIT in the US. Today, his firm manages more than 60 billion in assets on behalf of high net worth individuals and, of course, institutional investors. From 1995 to 2005, Barry was the chairman and CEO of Starwood Hotels and Resorts, a company he founded. He built it into one of the leading hotel companies in the world, but importantly, he also created the W Hotel brand and built the St. Regis from a single hotel into a global brand that everybody's aware of. 2008, he founded SH Group, his current management hotel management company, which owns the Baccarat Hotel and Resort chain, as well as the new One Hotel brand, which we're going to ask you a little bit about in a minute. So please join me in a huge round of applause for Barry Sternlich. Okay, let's jump in. Barry, you've participated in the Toronto Real Estate Forum two or three times in the past. And uh, the first question we always ask is, what do you think about the real estate market in North America? I'll, I'll, I'll use North America as opposed to Canada. <coughs> Over Ooh. the next 12 to 18 months, what are, you, uh, what are you seeing? Well, first, thanks for having me back. Um, it's always fun to come up here, even though I'm living in warm Miami these days, <laughs> and it's not warm up here. Um, so I've caught a little cold, but it wasn't a, a Canadian cold. It, it pre predated my arrival here. Uh, so I think the world is fascinating. It's interesting your poll, 60, 40, negative, or the US economy was catching up to world global economies that were moving further ahead than it was. And now that's reversed. The US economy is kind of dragging along global economies. The, German GDP was negative, Japanese GDP last quarter was negative, and people are kind of worried about China. China obviously is engulfed in some conversations with our POTUS, um, which are going to impact its future growth. Um, but you know, when we raise capital in the sector, we have three green lights we talk about, like the real estate cycle. And, and the first one, can you still buy assets with positive leverage? And you can still do that. You still buy it yields, finance inside of that. And, and that, if you're picking decent markets, means that you get paid to wait. You buy it at a six, finance it at a four, and you get an eight or nine, whatever your leverage is, and you wait. Uh, if you get the growth right, you get a reasonable return. Um, that spread between cap rates and, and interest rates is highest in Europe today. And it's a focus of ours right now. We are very tilting ourselves towards Europe because the risk of rising rates in Europe is a lot less than it was before Powell spoke yesterday in the United States. 
Um, but the spread is, especially in things like multifamily, has closed uh, significantly in the US. Um, you used to have to, own, the only place in the world you could get the spreads of five, four or five cap rates and finance it, one was Japan, but now you can do that all over the world, particularly in Europe. Uh, that's one, positive leverage. Two, um, supply. Are they building a ton? Um, and that has some pockets of problems. There's definitely, I was driving by some gigantic hole on the way here this morning, and I, I'm wondering what could possibly be going in that. It looks like as big as um, Canary Wharf. It's a gigantic hole. Oh, I don't know what direction I was coming Probably from. Probably the well. It was huge. Um, and it's funny, for a market that, that globally is fairly disciplined in the bank sector, I, I, I'm marveling at the amount of construction. There's, and uh, there's a lot of construction. And, and, and I get, because we, we run the largest property trust, the mortgage lender in the United States, it's not a bank. Um, we see a lot of submissions for construction loans. And uh, one was submitted to me recently. A hedge fund manager in New York who's going to build an apartment building. And the two buildings behind it are currently selling for like $400 a foot. He's building directly in front of it. He's going to get $1,000 a foot. And the loan is only $600 a foot. I don't even want the debt, nevertheless, the equity. So the markets have, um, you've seen irrational exuberance in, in people's desire to build in certain markets, certain property types, certain hotel markets, obviously some multi-markets in the US. Um, so supplies, it's not as green as it was in general, like office is not really overbuilt in the US and we're seeing some really good rent growth in, in various markets, really good. Um, and you don't really have a massive supply issue in Europe, although there's surprising construction, but most of it is pre-let. So Europe looks better on the supply side again. And the third one for us is are you paying, are you, can you still buy assets below replacement cost? because if you're paying a big premium, that only induces more supply. And uh, the stuff you bought in the first case with positive leverage, well, the rents will go down if there's too much supply. So there you have to be honest with yourself. If you're buying a 30-year-old multi, paying 90,000 a unit, and a new unit costs 200,000 to build, it's not actually, yeah, you're buying below replacement costs, but it may be an obsolete asset. You know, it, it should be significantly cheaper than new construction. On the other hand, it attacks the market from a position of um, you can charge less rent. And so in the US, we were the second largest multi-owner in the country. Uh, we had 120,000 units at peak. Today, we're at 77,000 units. But I think that makes us the third largest property multi-market market rate apartment owner in the United States. And um, you know, people ask where we think we are in that cycle. And we just sort of, we're buying and selling. We're doing both. Although, the, you know, it, it's not as easy pickings as it was before. So all three green lights are still there. One of them is like beginning to turn lime green or a little bit yellow, which I'd say is supply. Um, I do think we have, you're at an interesting point. I'm very cognizant of the economic cycle, and I think the U.S. will slow down in 2020, and maybe materially. Um, and you can't think about Merkel or all the other situations in the world that could upset all this. What you do know is, on top of a four-something unemployment rate when Trump took office, he passed a $300 billion stimulus package that nobody saw coming, and he made them spend it in the two years to the midterms. So we spent $170 billion last year, we'll spend $130 billion this year, and then we run out of gas, then there's no more money left to spend in 2020. So just that alone, on top of a labor market that's so tight now that you're creating major distortions in the labor market, um, I think we will, I don't think we'll go negative, but I heard this morning two uh, pundits on CNBC say 2.8 and 2.5 GDP. I think you're talking single digits, like a one, a one handle. Um, and it's probably because also I don't see Congress doing anything. And with a split Congress, I don't see them getting another package through. Trump would just, he loves this. He is an unadult, he's the biggest checkbook ever. And he's just like, write more checks. They're not, they're not charging me for all this overdraft. I have the permanent overdraft. I'm running a, I'll run a trillion dollar deficit. This is the man who ran on, these deficits are so big. And um, 
And we're running, we ran a $100 billion budget deficit last month in, in a raging economy. It's unprecedented. That's the biggest risk I see. So, you know, in, the, in a world of um, floating in liquidity, and, and we printed, printed like $12 trillion globally in the financial crisis, there's so much money out there, it's staggering. And it's weighing on global rates. You know, it's, everyone's searching for yield. And we all would have expected the U.S. 10-year to be three and a half, four. Some guys had it at six, smart people. Um, and it's 3.04 last night. I don't know where it was this morning. Um, and I, 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 you, the big worry is people say enough of, I'm not going to buy your bonds. We're going to be issuing bonds as far as the eye can see. And, uh, and he's, you know, the economy from a fiscal discipline standpoint is a complete shambles. Um, and the Japanese and the Chinese, who bought half of all the paper that the government issued in the uh, recovery, aren't buying anything anymore. So the only one who's going to buy it are probably domestic players. The government isn't buying either. They bought another 40% of it. So who's going to buy all the debt? If it's us, individuals or institutions, we're going to take the money out of the equity markets. So, 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 so let's, let, me, let me help distill this a little bit. Yeah, I probably there. need a drink. <laughs> there's, a, there's a drink right there. I'm getting myself there's depressed. <laughs> so, so I'm actually fairly sanguine, but go ahead. I'll tell you A lot you why. of great insight, a lot of great insight, but let's distill it down. 2019, is it going to be this much of the same? Is it going to be a little up, a little down? You said, I think, that 2020, in your mind, will start to fall a bit. Is yeah. that your general yeah, view? Yes, 19 won't be as good as 18, and 20 won't be as good as 19. So, and I, I think you have momentum, US economy is strong, the labor pressures on construction costs and are really heavy. We are seeing massive increases in construction costs in the United States, both in land development and materials, the labor, the construction jobs, the average worker, construction guy in the United States is like 55. There just aren't enough construction guys. And uh, we, so you're having all kinds of problems in the housing market, trades in New York City, building a hotel. Um, they are very busy, the construction workers. And there aren't that, we thought they went to frack when they, in the finance, you know, in 07, 08, all the home building guys, they became frackers. And then the oil market crashed, and then they didn't come back. We don't know where they are. So we don't have the construction background that we had. So the, by the way, this all leads to why I'm still relatively bullish on real estate, because everything you own is going to be worth more it costs more to build. So, and there's two scenarios, right, that we think about. One, okay, rates rise in the U.S. They resume on the strength of a very robust economy. Um, if that happens, I think we're in good shape in real estate. And I'll stick to the U.S. for a second because you'll see demand increases with wage increases. We own, sadly, some uh, retail properties. But retail sales are picking up because the average guy has a little more money in his pocket. He's got 15 bucks an hour, not $11 an hour. And he's spending that money and he didn't buy the new iPhone. So that 1000 bucks he can go spend on socks and hats and clothing and things we sell in the malls. Um, so there's one scenario that rates rise, demand rises faster, rents continue to rise, offices absorb, business cycle's good, hotels are full. That's a really nice cycle. Modest inflation, 2 to 3 percent, 3 percent, 3.5 percent, 10 year. That's probably great um, because you're going to have rising construction costs. And the gap, if you own, we just bought a, a tower in downtown Portland, the Wells Fargo headquarters, the tallest building in the state, maybe two states. And we bought it for like $280 a foot. And you couldn't, you couldn't build this, put the steel in for $280 a foot. And we're, we're retrofitting it, we'll clean it up, we lease the base to one of those shared office companies. Um, so we think that's great investing, great risk reward investing. On the other hand, if rates rise because there's a global strike on credit that people hate us and they don't buy our debt and there's nobody to buy our debt and we're issuing 100 billion, then 120 billion, then 140 billion, we're kind of in a death spiral on our deficit. And the entitlement wave disaster hasn't hit us yet. And we are the reserve currency of the world, so we get away with it. But at some point, the Chinese, if we really pick a fight, they're already buying all the world's infrastructure. And uh, they, they control, I, had, I was with the head of OPEC the other day, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, which is a private funding arm of the US government. They use strategically to 
trade development around the world. He said five of the six ports of the Panama Canal are owned by the Chinese terminals for the containers. And they were asking, they were actually begging an American to buy the remaining port. So we would have at least a terminal. The Chinese decided to close the Panama Canal. They're, they're buying a port in Cartagena, outside Cartagena in Colombia, the Chinese. And it's a strategic military base for the United States, that region. I mean, they're not, while they're, Trump is screaming at them, doing everything else he does, they're not, they have plan B, C, and D. And they run the country like a company with a very good CEO. And they have a 100-year plan, not a quarterly plan. So they are definitely on the move globally. Latin America, I was with the President Macri of Argentina for lunch. Every tender for every infrastructure project has been bought by, won by the Chinese. And they are busy, busy, busy. To, and we are not that big a portion of their exports anymore. We were, not anymore. So they're, they're preparing themselves to gird for battle and, and with, with our, our ego. And uh, it's, it's an interesting issue, it's particularly as it rate, it, interesting as, it, so we're gonna go slower because in, CEOs, of which I'm one, are nervous. Like we don't exactly know what to do with our capital spending. So capital spending in the United States is slowing down. It used to be, I'm on the board of a multinational, we used to, you know, we're investing in China. We have a fast-growing business in China. It's Estee Lauder. It's a cosmetic company. Um, but on the margin now, do we build that plant in China? Or do we build it? What is going to happen on repatriation of capital? Will the Chinese confiscate our assets? Will they have a national embargo against American goods? And the growth market in the world for most American companies was the Chinese middle class, the expansion of the Chinese markets, even if there were tariffs to enter the market. So it's a fascinating world. Um, in the scenario that they boycott our debt, that's really bad. And it's bad for the, the economy, obviously, traders. Real estate at the end of the day provides yield. We're not gonna be a bad place to hang out. I mean, it, it's gonna be, at the end of the day, if, you, if, 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 the econ if rates skyrocketed, they would then fall, right? Because they push the economy into a recession, globally, Canadian, everyone's. And so rates go down, and now your yielding properties look okay. Getting from here to there is going to be a challenge, but um, don't have debt that's expiring. So, so if, if rates go up uh, sort of modestly, there's job inflation, tenants can pay higher rent, that's all good. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> if, it, if, they, if they start to rise as a result of some bad things, some of the things you've just talked about, not so good. But uh, zeroing in on the CEO comment that you made, what are you doing with your portfolios? Are you long, you're short? Interest rates, uh, are you somewhere in between? Well, is it, is it different in different geographic regions, as an example, Barry? So I think we, we have our, our last fund that we just uh, late, raised early last year is seven and a half billion. Uh, the last, the one before that was five, six, and before that was four, two. These are the opportunity funds. We do other stuff. Um, and they invest in real estate globally. Personally, the only risk I see, our funds look really good. Our ninth fund and 10th fund are both 20 IRRs and fairly solid, so I shouldn't say that like that. <laughs> I have to go now. Um, but, uh, you know, they're, they're, they both have returned all their capital and then some, so they're fairly well baked. But the big risk is exit yields, right? We were all worried that rates would rise, and we're getting a bit of a... a of a timeout now with rates actually falling in the U.S. because there was a perception the economy was slowing. Um, and so personally, what I did is I shorted interest rates. I have a massive personal hedge in my, against my real estate book by shorting the U.S. 10-year. And um, I'm, I call it an insurance trade because the only risk in our portfolio is I'm selling my multis not at a four and three quarter, five and a quarter, five and a half, but at a six and a half. And I can't directly hedge my funds. My institutions would be pissed if I lost money in a big hedge. But I'm not going to sit back and watch this happen, which was pretty obvious this could happen. So to hedge your real estate exposure, you can hedge yourself with rates, because it is the cap rate on exit that's going to, you know, the rising rates are beginning. We just sold a couple billion dollars of multis in the US, and we got a 4.3 and a 4.6 cap, both to offshore capital, way inside our expectations, frankly. Um, but the markets are even thinning there, you know, that, that because the buyer that was simply, like I had friends 
Just buying multis, financing them off LIBOR and pocketing 8, 9, 10, 11, 12% cash on cash yields. That trade is over right now. So they're out. So you have core, core guys back in. And if you look at the global flow of capital, the Chinese have left the market, right? They're gone. We've had two different Chinese groups walk on deals we had with them. They're not even allowed to buy hotels in the US right now, or gaming, or entertainment. They're gone. The Canadians have kind of pulled back. Uh, we don't see you the way we saw you a couple years ago in cities like New York and other big places. You show up occasionally, but you're cherry pickers now, sadly. Um, we like the wave of undisciplined investors. Where did you go? Uh, and, uh, <laughs> you've gotten way too smart. The, uh, which is true, actually. Your institutions are good, and they, they're solid. They've got good teams in place, and they do stuff themselves. Um, the Europeans are dabbling in the US. Uh, the Koreans were really big and pulled back because what interesting thing happened, which has nothing to do with real estate, but the changing yield curve in the United States made them actually lose money or gain nothing swapping into dollars. Whereas European investors to the US, like if we invest in Europe right now because of the European curve and our curve, we're picking up two, 300 basis points in the IRR. So we have a much better play to there, then, and, and they have a, and so the money from Korea is drying up. Now we've seen Southeast Asian money, and the Middle Eastern money, you know, depending on what your view is on the Saudis, the, the PIF, the big fund that was supposed to be funded by Aramco's IPO, it never happened. So they have $50 oil again this morning, and they're not going to be, be able, I, I don't know if they'll be able to fulfill or expand dramatically their commitments in property. So who is going to buy? Where is the big tower buyer going to come from right now? It's not obvious to me. And, um, and we're actually looking at some major office deals in some markets. And the, there's, there are big opportunity funds. And there are, we all have money from dozens of sovereign wealth funds. Quality is going to work in this cycle. So the best stuff will trade with long-term holds. Um, but the tangential stuff, the marginal stuff, it's not obvious today where the money, the big, where's the big money? And everyone prices off that marginal guy. It was the Chinese, like, they bought that deal and everybody thought they were rich because they bought it at a three cap in Manhattan. Um, that's gone. So, you know, we, we, we're, you, you're finding some outlier bids, but there aren't as many people as there were before. So I would say pricing is holding, but it's a little down, but it's not... It's not down as much as I would have thought it should be down. Uh, and there's a lot of dry powder in funds, but the big institutional buyers don't seem to be around the way they were. So I'm curious as to your view on this. Some people have said that, um, that uh, the real estate market now has matured to such an extent that the volatility that we once saw in real estate is gonna be muted more sophisticated investors, more access to capital, more disciplines. Um, wh what are your thoughts on that? Should I use a Sam Zell word? That's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll attribute that to Sam. I didn't say that. I'm a much more polite person. Um, I, I don't think we're, so. We're going to get to Sam. I think that's wishful thinking. <laughs> I mean, real estate guys are like locusts. You just give us money and we'll build. Right? They come out of the ground. You think they're dead and they just come rise out of the ground and they build in their backyard. We can't help it. Um, so no, so I think you still, I, I don't, you still see the same cycle. Absolutely, I mean like, uh, look at the hotel market in the United States. Marriott and Hilton, to some extent Hyatt, they bought um, Thompson Hotels and Two Roads. They are actually worried about their fleets, I think, though they'll never admit this. Um, they have a product in Marriott and Sheridan that's kind of like Kellogg Post it's old. It doesn't appeal to millennials. It's like, it's kind of like boring. And uh, people want more. They want something more, the millennials. They want experiences. They want authenticity. So they're busy now trying to diversify their fleets. They've got True and I don't know, Edition and whatever else they're doing. Uh, home Two Suites, Two Home Suites, Home Two Suites, Suites, Suites. They have a thousand new brands and they're building a thousand of them. As long as they can find someone to build them. They'll either support the development or they'll cut their fees going in. So you're seeing a lot of companies panic to actually provide new product to this 
powerful millennial generation, which is 94 million people strong in the U.S., and it's the largest cohort of our entire demography. So I think uh, that, and look at the shared office space. You know, that is a full-grown um, frenzy in the United States. And uh, there's about, I think that somebody told me there's 65 shared office companies operating in Manhattan. I mean, anyone can be in shared office. You get a beer tap and four desks, and you're in business. And um, so a pool table, maybe, a small one, because you've got to get density. Um, but you know, these businesses, they're interesting businesses. They're changing the way we work. It's a funny word, we work. Um, and uh, and it's, it's, the products are changing. And technology is, is helping. I was talking about this yesterday. It doesn't help you to have great data. I was on a panel with my former partner, Bobby Faith, who runs Graystar, which is the largest multifamily operator. We were talking about data, how it influences our business. Having great data, which we have, and we know turnover is different in Atlanta for apartments than it is in Dallas, than it is in Denver, than it is in Phoenix. We can use that data to perfectly underwrite the assets. So we know it's 17% turnover in the apartments in Atlanta and 45 in Dallas. That will affect your capital costs. That doesn't help you against a stupid buyer. It also doesn't help you against a buyer that has a lower cost of capital than you do. You can have all the data you want. It won't matter. Where it will help you is you could run your properties cheaper, theoretically, outsourcing energy, buying better fuel, better purchasing, sourcing, modular construction, whatever it might be. Technology is going to change, probably lower the cost of entry. I mean, if modular really takes off, People are talking about construction costs for apartments, 30% less than current costs. If you can do that, then you better be careful with your existing stock, because all that pressure on rising construction costs just went the other way. They're falling. Now you have obsolete properties at a premium to replacement cost. You have to really watch these things. The good news in real estate is it doesn't hit you overnight. They're big waves, right? You can just see the waves coming and going. Just Ride the wave. Don't stand in front of it watching it crash on your head. So, um, and that's what we try to do. Because we're moving big capital and we try to anticipate flows. And, and we, for the most part, we've been reasonably successful over what's now a fairly long career. I can't so, believe I started in 91. Yeah, so just I'm talking tired. about that. <laughs> let's go back to, let's go back to some of the early years. After, after, uh, after business school, you, uh, you joined JMB Realty, a company led by Neil Blum. Many people here in this audience will remember that JMB bought Cadillac Fairview, which turned out to be not such a good deal for, for JMB, but ultimately created an opportunity. No, no. It was a really bad deal for their investors. It was a decent deal for JMB. <laughs> well, were, did you work on that deal? No. But I was there. Are, are you they, sure? I, <laughs> I, I actually did meet one, one of the Bromfins, Charles, for yeah. some reason in that process. But I wasn't working on the deal. I, I was doing another deal. But we were making, or they were making, uh, they got a $25 million a year management fee right. for like one undergrad college girl who was watching the deal for them. And, uh, <laughs> true. and so the profit margin on the fee was pretty good. And um, uh, Neil sued when they lost their money the investor lost some money, he sued the investors for the rest of his management fees. It put him in the penalty box for quite a while with the institutional community. Um, but I, I had nothing to do with that. But, but, but let's just look at that. Go. That is a quintessential psych, bad cycle deal because it was negative leverage. Right? The cap rate on the malls of Cadillac Fairview was lower than the cost of financing. So if it didn't, cash flows didn't rise, you went bankrupt. And they went bankrupt. So, it was a really bad cycle play. You know, the most interesting thing about Neil, who's a great mentor, and I learned a ton from him, I'm still friends with him, he's my first investor in, in Starwood Capital Group. Um, he idolized the Reichman brothers, absolutely. And people don't remember that the Reichmans were the richest people in the world. And they were here, right? And he'd come up to Toronto, and at that time, JMB was like $24 billion in real estate. It was enormous. Back then, that was a... Huge. It's probably us at 300 billion or something. I don't know with the, with inflation. Um, and Albert would say, you know, rates are going down. Neil would run back to Chicago and change the entire firm's balance sheet based on it. It was like coming to see the Lord. You know, he'd come up here. It was like Moses spoke to him about rates. <laughs> and we followed the Reichmans to to Europe, to London. Yeah. They were they were building. They'd done this deal with a company called um, Stanhope, 
they built a lot of the assets in the city of London, and then they did Canary Wharf. And I remember I was in Neil's office when Albert and Paul called him and said, we'll sell you an interest in the Canary Wharf. And they, they, Neil's like, how much should it be? And he said, well, we don't actually know what it's going to cost, but maybe around $5 billion for your interest. And, and so Neil actually decided that we'd get bigger into London. We bought a company called uh, uh, um, Brandsworth, which I did work on. And we lost all our money. Oh boy. And it was the most important deal of my career, by far. 1988. Uh, uh, was, was it, was it the it was, Cycleberry? Or so was it, yeah. it was exactly that. You know, you had the richest people on earth plowing as much money as they could into the London market. I went to see 14 property analysts in London. 13 were wildly bullish. One said, get out of Dodge. I didn't pay attention. I learned this in, about investing. I mean, pay attention to the outlier. Like, why is that one stock at 32 times EBITDA and everyone else is 22? Or why are they 12 and everyone else is 22? You learn from the outlier. For me, and I said this in an article that came out yesterday, actually, I learned intellectual humility. Neil Bloom said to me, you know, if this is the top of the London office market, then blah, 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 and he's on the Forbes for 100, and I'm worth like negative $8,000. I'm like, okay, right? But I looked at it. We had a second deal tied up. We were buying the twin of Stanhope. It was called Rose Howe. But together, they built a lot of the buildings in the city of London. And uh, we were set to close. And I walked around London. He was on vacation in Tucson. I called him from London. He sent his closer over to, to close the deal. And we would have done this one in our PA. And the firm's personal account was Neil's own money. And uh, I said, you can't do this deal. And yes, what, we, what happened was interest rates were 14%. And we were buying properties at six caps. And um, actually, what, it's interesting because we, we had arranged financing at like nine, and uh, we thought rents were going to grow, and we get out of that thing, that mess. And he came up here, and somebody said something about rates. He floated the rates, and they went the wrong way. And when we closed, it was 14%. So you have properties earning six and debt at 14. I could look out two years, I'd see they were going to cross, we were going to go bankrupt the day we closed. And I walked into Judd Malkin's office, and I said, you've got to go raise more equity. I said, we can't. I said, well, you're going to go bankrupt. There's no other choice. They can't go back. Two years later, they had to go back. They did do a raise, but they didn't raise enough, and then they went so bankrupt they did, again. They did, they did close? They closed. They did not, close. The, not the one in his PA. Oh, OK. When I called Neil on Rose Howe, he, he backed off. He, we left the closing table, and, and we walked away. And if we'd done that deal, Neil would be in trouble today. So, but I think you learn from your mistakes, right? And that was, I, I didn't make the call, but I did the work. I was just a VP at the time. Um, but the very smart guy wasn't really in the driver's seat, wasn't paying attention. And we didn't listen to the outliers. So that's what you learn from. So for me, you know, I, I say keeping, when you're successful, keeping your intellectual humility and waking up every day assuming you have a thesis, but you have to have a thesis to live and invest, at least, in investing. But be wary of being a, like a blockhead. Take in all this data and challenge your thesis all the time. And if it's over, change your thesis, right? Change your mind. I, I have a friend, Paul Tudor Jones, who's one of the greatest hedge fund traders in the world has ever seen. And I was with him a couple, um, a year ago or so, and he's like, I love gold. So of course, I go back to my office and buy some gold. <laughs> and then the gold goes down. I call him up. He goes, oh, no, I liked it for five minutes that day. <laughs> <laughs> Did you call me? So uh, you okay. know, these, these guys, so we get to do that. We have to stay aware of the, you know, you're, I'm, the way I play real estate, I'm all in. I like, if I'm doing this, I'm going to give it my best, I'm all in, I lead everything, I listen. I spend a lot more time today on global factors because the flow of capital overwhelms fundamentals. I've learned that the hard way, right? I mean, we see people do dumb things and they get bailed out and make a lot of money. So pay attention to the flow of capital. The fundamentals, you can get run over being right by money going out and coming into the asset class. The flow of capital, and, and that way, one of the other disagreements I had with Neil was I told him, I think it was 1990, it was the, right before the big SNL crisis, we were sitting, and I was asking Neil, because I wasn't really a real estate guy, I said, why are we buying malls at six when we can buy corporate bonds at nine? He goes, real estate's just different. I said, it doesn't make any sense to me. 
Like, why would you take all that risk in operational challenge when you can buy? He said, the real estate asset class isn't like the other asset classes. And it is. They're, all these asset classes are correlated to each other. You learned in 07, 08 that everyone was long everything. Everyone was levered long. The only thing that rallied in 08, 07, 08, not oil, not, I, it was bonds, because people, it was a flight to safety. Everything else, venture, private equity, real estate, gold, oil, everything went down. And so, and that obviously affects real estate, because your pension funds are all of a sudden overweighted to an asset class they get to mark down more slowly than the stock market. Right? And then all the money stops. And so you must pay attention to the flow of capital. And, and if you're in this business, you, should, you, know, you can have your little micro deal. You can be building your properties. But if you want to get lucky or, or find the warning signs to get out early or pre-sell your building, think about the world. So you leave J&B and you start Starwood, which, of course, has been a great success over a lot of years. Um, you started in the, in the multifamily. <coughs> Uh, uh, which, which I think you ultimately sold maybe to Sam Zell. Yep. He probably paid you too much money, right? We tripled our The grave dancer million. paid you too much money. Did it again later. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we, we sold, we, we put 50 odd million dollars and we made $180 million. So Starwood. And that, was our, that, was our, that was our 10 year plan in 18 months for Bobby and I. So you enter the hotel business and I think this is, this is something that a lot of people in the crowd want to hear about. What's so great about the hotel business? You've had an unbelievable career. I talked about some of the things at the outset. What is the, you know, what are the two or three things that you always think about in the hotel business and what makes the big difference for you? Um, um, I, uh, when I entered real estate, I really love architecture and design. My mom's an artist. I was an artist in high school. I would have been an artist. My mom said I was going to starve. So the only place that I can really I felt that I could execute my design side of my mind was in the hotel space. So I really wanted to do W Hotels. I wanted to create a cool global boutique where you, did, you could still get your, your wake up call or, your, or your, your decent food. And I was really good friends with Ian Schrager, but I thought his hotels were, were too cool. Like the TV, if you're in bed, the TV was over here and it was this big. And uh, there was no service at all. So we did a branded boutique in W, and that was sort of fun. And it took off, and I remember the Prudential Analyst walking through the first W in New York City with me, saying, well, what are you going to do when this is a fad and it fails? And I said, it's not going to fail. And it turned out to be hugely successful. So yes, what, I, what, I look, what I try to do in hotels is, is, is I didn't know I was doing it, but I, I've always tried to create experiences, like create something that's memorable. And that applies to everything you own in real estate, but in, in today, particularly in retail. I mean, if you don't stand for something, you don't survive in retail. People so talk, don't... talk about one hotel, which is your current. So one hotels, when I decided I was gonna do another, I didn't own W, I built it in Starwood Hotels and I was a CEO and I did well financially, but I would have done a lot better if I owned it personally. So I decided to uh, do another hotel brand, but I kind of made a lot of money. I didn't really want to do something, just another hotel brand. So I said, well, we're, I met Blake Mikowski, who runs Tom Shoes, and uh, a big, uh, they grew their business by giving away a pair of shoes for every shoe, pair of shoes you bought to indigent children. And uh, so I, my kids and I were into the environment, and I, I, I think in W, what I, what I saw was that hotels were meeting places in Asia. In the U.S., we dumbed it down. Like, we, you were in and out of a hotel as fast as you could. So I wanted to make the hotel a meeting place again. In, the U.S. is always slow to do things. In Europe, they are way ahead on us, and Canada, too, on the environment. And I figured that we were going to get there. Um, and it was time we did something. So I, want, I decided I was going to build a sustainable hotel brand, a, a brand that could teach you, teach you you could live well, but still live green, and, if every, and, and more sustainably. And if everybody did it, and we were copied, I'd made the world a better place. Um, and if we made money doing it, that would be great. So we uh, opened the uh, one South Beach, the one hotel South Beach, which is, was voted the seventh best hotel in the United States last year in November's Condé Nast Reader's Choice Awards. And then we opened the one Central Park um, and the one Brooklyn Hotel, which is the first new build. We're opening LA, Cabo, San Yat China, Paris, London. Mil uh, we have one here, actually, coming here. Okay, good. Uh, and I think um, Sunnyvale, working on something in Napa. Uh, so the brand has taken off, 
and we're running, we're crushing all the flags, which I just love. Uh, because we're doing it with social media and a no, zero ad budget. We have never taken an ad out. We run the, the, the one South Beach will run nearly $2,000 a night next week. 99% fall. It's word of mouth. People find stuff today. They find it. They find it. You, maybe, many of you may have heard of Auberge um, or uh, Montage. Montage had one hotel down in, in Dana Beach, I guess, or um, Laguna Beach. And yet in that world, to that customer, people knew it. They found it. And they don't have 3,000 people at corporate. They don't have global sales teams. We don't either. But we compete and, and, and win against all the majors. So um, for me, I, I say it's not a brand, it's a cause. One Hotels is a cause. And it actually orients our employees and our guests really love the message we're, we're sending. So we try to use as much recycled stuff as we can. Half the stuff in Brooklyn was sourced locally. I do farm to table. And I, it's fun. For me, that's like a refuge. That's like I have fun doing design, working with great designers, working with my design team. And, um, and, for, I, I, and I, I think design matters. You know, I, 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 get, I got criticized a lot in the days of running Star Hotels that I was picking bedspreads and, and wall paint. And I wasn't picking them all the time, but when you have a fleet of assets and you're trying to create a brand, that was my product. So, uh, you know, the best thing is when great people bring you stuff much better than you could do yourself. And that's, what I, those are the, that's the real fun I have when my team makes me look good. We're well over time. Thank you very much for doing this. Very insightful. I'm sure everybody really appreciated your comments. Let's have another huge round of applause for Barry Stringer. Thanks, Rachel.